This widely cited study was, was shocking when it first appeared, uh, almost d being dismissed. I mean, how could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gases than all the cars, trucks, planes, and trains that we drive and fly every day? It was hardly believable. But, but instead of 18%, as the original 2006 United Nations report stated, a number of researchers, I independent of each other, have now found that livestock can produce, it's possible, that they can produce as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions found in our atmosphere, mostly created by the respiratory carbon dioxide and the land use changes that, that they didn't account for in that first report and the methane production by these billions of animals themselves. It's not due to confinement or as a byproduct of factory farming methods. Now, most researchers now agree that this figure is minimally 30%. And this is also without factoring in, it's without factoring in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish. The fuel, refrigeration, processing, packaging, transportation, etc. Regardless of where this exact number resides, somewhere between 30 and 51 percent, it's not 18. And it's also not acceptable. A perfect example of how this information is suppressed occurs every single year during our climate change conferences, held originally in Kyoto with its 1997 Kyoto Protocol, and most recently it was in Doha where countries come together and they're, they're, they're trying to solve this global warming problem, at least superficially, but none of this is being addressed. In fact, it, at these conferences, it's now being postponed. Um, it's very important for them and everyone else to understand that it won't really matter how many light bulbs are changed out, and it won't matter how many hybrid cars there are on the road if we don't first change out the way we eat. Nothing was really accomplished at Doha then, consistent with previous conferences, primarily because the two largest emitters in the world, China and the US, don't participate. <laughs> and, and, and the countries that do, the 200 countries that are in attendance, well, they can't agree on anything. So, so now the attention at these prestigious conferences are turning to how we can all adapt <laughs> to climate change, since it appears to be inevitable to, to them uh, uh, that, uh, that climate change is inevitable rather than just putting forth the effort to, uh, to mitigate it. Every aspect of global depletion then has a timeline. It's not really a, a question of if we're going to run out of something, it's, it's when. The most critical timeline of all, I, th I think, is climate change. We have a three to four year window of time from now to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions or we will eventually see irreversible warming of our planet. Most experts agree that if our planet's temperature increases just two degrees centigrade, just two degrees centigrade from previous historic levels, well, we're going to see catastrophic effects, complete loss of island countries, severe droughts, flooding, storms. Some of that sound familiar? Yeah, that's because we're already halfway there to that two degrees centigrade mark. In fact, the International Energy Agency has been quite clear about that window of opportunity for us to limit global warming and, and that that window closes at the end of year 2017. Sounds pretty scary to me something everyone should be aware of and concerned about, right? But what does this have to do with food? Get this guy off the stage. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question because we all believe that climate change is caused by the energy sector, electricity, burning fossil fuels, especially coal. I mean, what certainly doesn't have anything to do with food. And that b belief begins with Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, and it carries right on through articles such as this one by Bill McKibben, where he blames Shell Oil, BP, and Exxon for climate change. They're the culprits. Well, they do have something to do with it, but whether it's with winning a Nobel Peace Prize or at an annual global climate change conference or with prominent publications such as this, those with a platform that are being heard have failed to mention or properly position the role of eating animals despite its incredible factual contribution of one third to one half of the problem. Here's some, some math to think about. Most climatologists feel that our planet's atmosphere can only take on another 565 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases by the year 2050, with any chance ever to stay below a two degrees centigrade rise. It's been shown that livestock can produce, it's possible, they could produce up to 32 gigatons per year. Carbon equivalent greenhouse gases from methane and carbon dioxide production, deforestation, et cetera. So without using any gas or oil, or coal ever again. It's conceivable 
it's conceivable that we could exceed our atmospheric carbon equivalent maximum, the 565 gigatons, by the year 2030 without the energy sector even factored into the equation. To summarize the connection between food choice and climate change, we have this. Climate change is very real, it's worsening, and the situation is urgent. Greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Raising animals for us to eat is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, as large or nearly as large as the energy sector. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms, but including grass-fed or pastured systems, will not solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make it much worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, and by far more production of methane, 40 to 60 percent minimally more methane produced per one single grass-fed cow. So looking at solutions, what do we have? Some prescriptions. Well, this is what we have. Um, the first approach is, is what I call the no worries approach <laughs> because, because it's not real. Climate change doesn't exist, right? That's what some people think. <laughs> and of course, the other approach is to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, just like McKibben and Al Gore and everyone else recommends. But renewable energy infrastructure, <laughs> such as building solar and wind generators all over our country to reduce climate change, well, that's a good idea. But it's projected to take at least 20 more years and $18 trillion to develop. Well, we don't, we don't have 20 years, and we certainly don't have $18 trillion. So another solution to climate change would be we could stop eating animals today. It doesn't have to take 20 years. And instead of $18 trillion, it costs nothing. That's the prescription to mitigate, not adapt to, but mitigate climate change.